Well, here I am outside again. Uh, we're back to my uh, green screen forest background. Uh, and I'm doing this because my power's out. Um, my power company decided that today was a good day for maintenance for the power system and my backup batteries ran out. And so now I am just rolling with various random gear that I can put together. So I figured why not? I'll record in the forest. Now, this is sort of breaking news, and we thought we wanted to get this out immediately. And this is a conversation that I'm having with Casey Dreyer, who is with the Planetary Society. Casey is a policy specialist. He learns how various NASA budgets, plans come together, all of the funding agencies, helps advocate for science within the US. And today is a very special day because a huge chunk of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab employees were laid off today. There are also implications with other programs within NASA. We've got the delays to the Artemis mission. What's going on with the Mars sample return mission? There's a lot of stuff that I wanted to talk to Casey about. So here is my interview with Casey Dreyer. Hey, Casey, it's good to see you again. Uh, you too. Uh, wish I could be here under happier circumstances, yeah. but always happy to be here. Well, it's kind of funny because we scheduled this like a week ago and there were other things we were going to talk about that were changing and, you know, new issues. And then suddenly it turned into a much uh, more interesting and kind of darker story. And so we decided to make this happen immediately. So, OK, so the big news, the thing that's breaking right now today is that NASA JPL announced last night that and with the most understated press release title ever it was like note about jobs <laughs> at JPL or something. But the reality is they're laying off a whole bunch of people at NASA JPL. Yeah, about 8% of its workforce plus and this is I think important real hundreds of contractors on top of that, uh, that have short term contracts, but still contribute a lot to a various number of missions. And of course, Mars sample return and the functioning of the lab. So a good number of people very rapidly, right? This is all happening in a single day. Uh, layoffs are happening pretty much as we are recording this right now. Yeah. And so like, like last night, when we got the press release, they didn't know who was getting laid off. They just knew that a big axe was falling. Now we're starting to get a sense of who's actually getting laid off and who's sticking around. Yeah, we will. We I think the JPL employees are learning this right now too. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the management knows. And yeah, I mean, how do you how do you clean out eight percent of your workforce overnight? And you know, this hasn't been. I guess there are degrees of surprise, right? It's when it happens. Of course, it's a shock. This hasn't been unprecedented. This has been stirring for a while. JPL started laying off contractors last month. Uh, JPL's been under a hiring freeze since September. Uh, they've been pulling back on expenses such as travel and, and major purchases. Things have been hemorrhaging and, and been very tight for months, all basically tied back to significant uncertainty over Mars sample return budget, of which JPL is the major NASA uh, facility servicing that, and all of the uncertainty around the future of the mission, political uncertainty, and, and really, though, at the end of the day, a stalemate between two chambers of Congress that is driving why we're getting layoffs, right? You know, very sudden layoffs rather than kind of a more orderly uh, wind down. And and so, I mean, you have been reporting positive news year after year, and you've been like genuinely surprised at how the funding for NASA has not just been what NASA was expecting, but in, in fact, a little more, like a little like, why don't you add a couple more goals? When did that funding tap change? Uh, well, this year really changed. And yes, you're right. NASA has been on a bull run in terms of its budget. It, it's, I think, longest, the longest sustained duration of regular budget growth. You know, not huge. You know, we didn't see Apollo level increases in NASA, but we've seen steady 3 4% growth year after year since 2014. You know, so almost 10 years. And that has, you know, that adds up. You know, NASA has about $5 billion more dollars in its budget now than it did 10 years ago. And you do a lot more with that, obviously, right? You're spending it on things. You're sending people back to the moon. You're doing this huge science portfolio. You're building a new space telescope. You're doing uh, Earth science observations. You know, all of the things, private and commercial spaceflight, public-private partnerships, CLIPS. 
Yes. Yeah, so we're doing a lot more and it has been only in the last year. So the, the first warning sign was last year when NASA, it still grew, but just less than the president had proposed. And prior to that, NASA had been growing more than the White House had proposed every year, just by a little bit, but still notable. Last year was the first time that that didn't happen in a while. It still grew relative to the previous year, but just not as fast. This year, and this is all traces back to Republicans took back the House of Representatives uh, in 2022. They had in 2023 a big bat. So the Democrats run the U.S. Senate. House is run by the Republicans. So they all got to have, you know, the, the much more political posturing and fighting and, and in reaction also to, of course, in inflation and things, you know, economic changing conditions. There was a very strong motivation to basically pull back on federal spending. And the deal was in order to extend the U.S. debt limit, I won't go into a whole deal of this, but the deal was to extend the debt limit. They were basically put a freeze on domestic uh, non-military spending which is the portion of the pie that NASA's budget comes from. So the pie shrank. And so everyone's slices got smaller. On top of that, this has been a perfect storm for NASA in a way. Uh, a number of stalwart, longtime, and very influential supporters in Congress retired. So you had a huge turnover, almost a complete turnover of the leadership of the appropriations committees in both Senate and the House and subcommittees that fund NASA specifically. And of the people who came in, None of them have a NASA center in their state or district. So that's a huge, it used to be, you know, like the head of, you know, Senator of Alabama, right? Senator of Florida, Senator of, you know, what, you know, whatever, California, right? That had big JPL in it. That's not the case now. We have senators from New Hampshire and Washington State and Kentucky and places that don't have the strong NASA connection. So the parochialism, right, that local political connection has shifted substantially in right. terms of where NASA's political support comes from. And they'll and add that all up together. It's, it's tough. Yeah. And like historically, like I think, you know, people from various political affiliations are, you know, their, their hackles are going to be raised at this point. But I mean, space, everybody loves space. Space is bipartisan. Everybody from, you know, you have proponents who may battle one another for all kinds of various legal issues who will join hands and vote for various space appropriations. It, it felt like like the one final non-political thing in in the U.S., <laughs> you know? It, it is, and it still is. And, and, and that's thanks for, for highlighting this, because this is an important distinction. This isn't the function of a sustained political attack on NASA. This is the consequence of larger political trends that impact things like NASA, and so no one's out to get NASA. And as you point out, the, the, the political dynamics are far more complex than your standard right and left issues in the United States. Uh, Republicans tend to be very generous to NASA over the years. The exact areas right depend. It tends to be more human spaceflight, exploration stuff, rather than things like Earth science. Democrats are more Earth science. But in, in you know, writ large, they're both very supportive. The problem is, is that it's not so much an anti-NASA or anti-space. It is a it's low on the priority list of the people in charge. And that's the shift. So very few people are willing to go to bat for NASA. When the overall pie shrinks, everyone starts chasing their piece. And again, at this point, it comes down to, at the end of the day, a lot of NASA tends like, is it in my district? Is it in my state? Do my constituents depend on it? Because that's how you get reelected. And if that's not the case, then it becomes harder, you know, the, the, the politics change. And that's what's driving a lot of what we're seeing. So NASA announced that they're cutting 8% of their workforce plus all of the contractors. Do you get a sense, like, how many people is 8% of their workforce and how many contractors are, I don't know, like, like it feels like that part's being kind of swept under the rug, but that's probably a large group of people too. Well, the, from what they've said publicly, and I'll just emphasize, I don't have any secret information I'm going by, <laughs> by yeah. public stuff too. Yeah. Uh, uh, they're laying off approximately 530 people today, right. so that's about eight uh, percent. And then you, the number of contractors they've they've mentioned again in these public statements it adds up to about 140, 150. So you're looking at in in writ large roughly 10 percent of what it seems to be the you know if you add up contractors, but it's hard to say. And contractors are on shorter timescales. It's not exactly clear you know what. Uh, 
how long their contracts were originally. But I mean, these people, it's like the day of, oh, yeah, you're no longer working for us. Sorry, you no longer have access. <laughs> you, you know, that's you, you have very little protection. And that's just, you know, you're a contractor. That's how you, how you work. But it is, yeah, it's a substantial part. And this is, you know, the, without precedent in recent memory uh, in terms of what's happening at JPL. And I think y- y- just to, to clarify here, this is very much right now a JPL situation. It's distinct because JPL is not like a standard NASA center. They have more like they're, they're what's called an FFRDC, uh, a federally funded research and development center. It's kind of a unique uh, organization that is it's owned by the government, but it's managed by Caltech, the university in California. So JPL employees are actually Caltech employees. There's more flexibility to ramp up and down hiring. Uh, but they have less protections. Uh, so you don't see this happening at other NASA centers because NASA centers otherwise are civil servants protected by a variety of federal statutes, and unions, and all these, a variety of other issues. It's much harder to reduce the force, uh, workforce in the NASA centers. That does not mean, though, that other NASA centers are not feeling the pinch. I think they're just feeling it in different ways. It's just not as public. Um, but, and we, we just have less to say because this is obviously the big newsy thing. But you look at a place like Goddard, which had until recently, as part of Mars sample return, a billion-ish level plus component of it, the CCRS, the containment capture uh, system, that was going to fly in the European uh, uh, orbiter, that was functionally ramped down to nothing. And so there was a lot of people working on that that now need to be absorbed into other parts of Goddard. Uh, We know, we've heard from people, this has not been stated publicly that I've seen, but we've heard from people at Goddard that contractors are being laid off there too. Um, And so this is, you know, we're seeing it at JPL. It's likely happening to some degree at other NASA centers as well because of MSR, but also broadly be this broader congressional stalemate in terms of NASA funding. Now, do we have a sense if whether there is like a a shaving and of of all the different missions and groups and all of the capabilities or are various missions being paused and entire teams are being laid off? We don't know that at, at, at this point. We'll find out probably by the end of the day. Yeah. My, the, if you read between the lines, the implication of the JPL announcement was that this is a a JPL wide layoff. They're absorbing because again, what happened? I mean, we're still haven't quite got to what happened here. Was right, which was that last year Mars sample returns budget was eight hundred and twenty two million dollars. That was funded. That was approved. That's a huge, you know, that's a huge amount of money. This year. We don't have a budget from our sample return, but we have two competing budgets, one from the Senate that says you are going to, we provide you only 300 million. We don't like the direction this is going. So that's a relative cut of half a billion dollars. The House did a completely opposite track. So no, you get your full funding. However, because there's no resolution to these two potential outcomes, NASA and the White House actually will throttle spending down to the lowest of all possible budgets. And so even though the Senate budget of $300 million, this half a billion dollar cut, has not passed into law, hasn't even passed the Senate, and the House is sitting here saying, no, we're going to give you close to a billion dollars. Do not do this. The risk posture of NASA is that we will not spend money that we might not have later. And so they're purposely throttling this down, even if it's unlikely to happen. And so... It's the very uncertainty of it. If they had resolved anything, if we had a budget, by, we're four months into the fiscal year with no budget. If, you know, so this, these layoffs are a, the suddenness of them, the, the, the breadth of them, um, and the troubles happening at other places. It's a dire- you can trace this directly back to Congress being unable to find any path forward on a budget. You know, so even if they came somewhere in the middle, right, the, the ideal compromise situation, you still you wouldn't see this level of difficulty. This is because they're they're going from eight hundred million to three hundred million, throttling that down to almost nothing. They've also mentioned that we're seeing cutbacks in all the subcontracts to private companies that were contributing to this as well. So you're probably seeing workforce issues there that just aren't being publicized. It's again huge mess and completely self imposed. I mean, we've seen this in the past. Uh, I forget what it was. It was about 10 years ago, maybe seven years ago. I forget exactly when we saw a bunch of cuts and we saw the cuts were in very ancillary parts of the organization. We saw education spending go down to zero. We saw public relations dramatically reduced. I mean, I guess they were saying like, let's keep engineers. And then anyone who is not an engineer working on some specific project, let's 
trim that back. And then a couple of years later, that all came roaring back with those increased budgeting. I mean, you've been th- you've seen how this all works. Is is that your expectation that it's going to be all of the non central activities are going to get or where the the cuts are going to come from? Again, I just don't know. That yeah. seems to that intuitively makes sense, but it, you know, you you just really don't know. Yeah. Um, it, a lot of people seem pretty worried through just anecdotally what I've heard from friends and contacts uh, at JPL. And again, it's you. You. It reminds you, though. I mean, there's. It takes a lot of. It takes a village to run a space program, and a lot of people uh, do a lot of different aspects of keeping a lab like JPL up and running. Again, I think you talk about this in 2013. We had sequestration. This basically a, across the board 10 percent cut really impacted outsize impact of planetary science, which is JPL's kind of main area of focus. And you know that was. You had you didn't have quite the similar rapid decline in that sense. You know, you you it was more telegraphed. It was actually the political outcome. It wasn't due to uncertainty. You didn't go from eight hundred to three hundred million in a year, right? That's a this the this that's a sixty two percent cut in a single year. So this is much more. This is why I think this is more visible. But yes, to your point, this is not the end of the story, right? And we do see. Anyone who studied NASA's budget history, um, which is what I do professionally, essentially, there there are good and bad periods. We we are coming out of a wonderful period, and I think in a sense it's almost a shock because we've been in a good period for so long that we're learning to accommodate this and deal with this and to see remind ourselves, oh, bad thing, you know, there are consequences for not spending money. This is not just these don't just go away. People's lives are impacted by this, and missions are impacted by this. There's a couple other. I'll just add a couple additional pieces of context here. In addition to MSR, JPL is particularly exposed, I think, financially, because it has a number of major missions that are wrapping up. Europa Clipper, that's a $5 billion flagship mission. That is launching this year. A lot of engineers and other project folks are going to roll off that mission as it goes into operations and is no longer being built. They need to find a job somewhere. You're reaching the end of... uh, uh, NISAR, which is a collaboration uh, mission with with ISRO, uh, that's going to be launching. That rolls off a lot of engineers. You're having a, and very little new work coming in. You're seeing because Veritas, this mission to Venus, that was a JPL mission uh, last year, was basically put on indefinite delay due to other budget problems. There's just been a ton and ton and ton of problems. And there are few missions coming down the pike for planetary science. Again, there, there's a lot of piling up of the issues here. And I think this is where we don't know how long this will last. And at the same time, you have people in the House Representatives, uh, Judy Chu, who represents JPL, who had a letter to the White House just last week with 43 other members of Congress, all from California, saying, do not do this. (laughs) We we are going to come through with the money. Don't do this. And of course they did. And so there's this story isn't done yet. What it does cause is just hideous amounts of disruption. Even if JPL hires everyone back, even if they, you know, you don't just turn off the lights and flip a project back into being. You have, you know, ironically, in a sense, the Senate will give them the intense benefit of a doubt here that they wanted what's best for sample return. They wanted NASA to do this correctly, which they should. They and they they were losing control of the project in a budget ter- uh, budget system that had more than doubled its estimates, uh, had been delayed. But by ramping it down like this, they are all but ensuring it will cost more money because of this rapid uh, unpredictability, uncertainty, and disruption that they're imposing on the project, unless it's canceled altogether, which no one wants. Right, right. And I want to spend some more time talking about MSR uh, later on in this in this interview. Um, but so what we didn't see with this announcement was the impact on any missions. It was just cuts to the workforce and no consequences to anything at all that we know of at the time that we're recording. Yeah, I mean, so the way that it generally works at JPL as an FFRDC is that a large number of staff are funded by a particular mission, right? So one, you're assigning full-time staff salary to the project budget of a mission. This is called full cost accounting. NASA went into this mode back in 2004. And so, you know, the Europa Clipper mission is paying for the salaries of a bunch of otherwise full-time JPL employees. 
And so JPL has all of this staff and it's like, okay, we have to have missions to keep them all funded because we just don't have pots of money sitting around to pay people. And that's what's essentially happening, I think, with JP with MSR is that the money ramped down. They don't want to, the the project is not canceled yet, right? It, it is very much not canceled. So they say, we've staffed up all these people that were otherwise being paid by MSR. The money's gone. How do we spread this around the lab to accommodate this cost? How do we carry this standing army of MSR uh, employees? And this is where, again, it, theoretically, you can't just cancel a mission in order to roll staff off of it, right? Because that has to be a headquarters decision. That becomes a bigger political decision. JPL can't be responsible for a single you know, mission living or dying without some kind of larger decision being made. But will it have impact? Sure. I mean, I, no one is working today at JPL. Literally, <laughs> the Mars rover, Perseverance, is not running today because they're laying off people at JPL. They're, they have a, a robot on Mars that is sitting doing nothing because JPL employees are getting laid off, right? And that's a symbolic situation if I've ever seen one. Right. The, the, it's waiting for a driver to be decided <laughs> to return to yeah, the driver's seat. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. So I want to shift gears then, and I want to talk about Artemis. So um, we got the announcement a couple of weeks ago that they were pushing back the Artemis program, Artemis 2, is getting shifted from 2024 to 2025. Artemis 3 is getting shifted back. What was the sort of major reason for shifting Artemis 2 back? Uh, the reasons they stated were particularly related to information they got related to the uh, heat shield on uh, kind of degrading faster than they expected on Orion coming back to Earth after Artemis 1. So they're reconfiguring the, the heat shield there's delays. They're taking components out of the first Artemis one, Orion, and, and sticking it into reusing it in Artemis two. That's taking longer than expected to refurbish those. There's a variety of just, and there's a, I think, a mechanical flaw that they had to fix in a variety of circuits in Orion. I mean, none of these are unexpected, right? These, the, the number, you, you just think it's statistically the number of components involved in the SLS and Orion, Orion stack. 0.02% of them will have problems. You have dozens and dozens of problems because there's probably hundreds of thousands, not millions of individual components. And so, and you're learning, you're learning how to do this again. You haven't done this in 50 years. Uh, so yeah, there's going to be issues. Whether that requires a year delay, that seems ex a lot <laughs> to me. But at the same time, I was there for the first SLS launch, or at least attempted launch. I went for the first couple nights. It did not launch. I had to leave and, and I missed the actual launch. And oh, I've yeah. so many times have I experienced that. Right. But I mean, I just was struck by SLS. It's it's such a finicky rocket because of this huge amount of hydrogen that it has to load into it. It's always, it kind of struck me that moment. It's like, this is always going to be a really finicky system. You're launching it once a year. That means every launch is kind of like the first launch, right? Because how many times can you really test all the components of a system when you're launching it once a year? You have to be so cautious Hydrogen is so tricky to work with because they're just tiny, tiny little atoms, right? They, they can leak really easily. And you think about then the, the decision tree to allow that to launch with humans on top of it. It's going to be very conservative. And I can see this continuing to slip. And this is the easy mission, right, of just looping around the moon. Of course, then Artemis three depends on the ex existence of a at best, wildly ambitious new launch vehicle, <laughs> like a, a mad fever dream of uh, like v Von Braun almost could not have fantasized so much of, of this type of system that is being put online by SpaceX. Um, that has to work, right? It has to be shown to work. And it does, I'm not saying it can't, but it's we got to get there. Um, that's not happening next year. And so there's a number of these major miracles that have to happen on top of, you know, even figuring out how to use the SLS in Orion which they're yeah. still going to be very much in the process of. Yeah, and I mean, that, that like, we discovered some problems with the heat shield. We want to work on the ventilation system. There's some power problems. We want to upgrade some components. We're going to shift it from 2024 to 2025. That all makes sense, you know? Like, so many delays. Let's get it right. Let's be safe. Sounds good. But mm -hmm. then they, they said they were going to push back Artemis III from yeah. originally 2025 to 2026 now. 
Is that right? Or 27. Or 27? I yeah, I yeah. forget. I mean, the point is, like, be prepared for more delays. Like, the chances that this is the last time they're going to announce a delay feels vanishingly small to me. And as you said, it is, you know, you were going from, you take this giant rocket that's kind of finicky with hydrogen, you send it out around the moon, and then it comes back. And then, you know, it's essentially Artemis 1, except it's got a, an easier flight path, but this time it's got humans on board. Um, you know, a few learnings are going to happen. But Artemis 3 is just so much more complicated. Um, where are we at all of the pieces coming together for Artemis 3 to happen? Well, again, it's it's really up to SpaceX. That's the big one. And obviously, they're they're making, by any objective measure, incredible progress. But they just have so many <laughs> things to do. And, it's, and you know, we could just look historically how long it took for commercial crew to finally get going. I think that was a three or four year beyond what their original expectation was. Of course, Boeing still hasn't launched commercial crew. Um, Starship is just doing so many that you have to prove out in orbit refueling. Uh, you have to prove out 24 hour functional turnaround of, of landing and launch uh, of Starship. You have to prove out landing on the moon with Starship, uh, which I think a good remi healthy reminder what we've seen from uh, Chandrayaan 2 and uh, the, the uh, Bereshit landing attempts. And even with Slim, the Japanese lander, like landing on the moon is, is really tough. Uh, even with a little thing. So it's a weird line to walk, right? As a space advocate, and I love this stuff <laughs> so much, um, but we do need to be, I just don't think we serve anybody by having completely unrealistic expectations. We need to acknowledge how insanely difficult this is going to be. Um, and because we, we need to sustain the political momentum. And right now, I think they have. The incredible thing to me is that NASA delayed all of this by years uh, for Artemis with no, it just no political repercussions whatsoever. They, it's it's really honestly astonishing how strong, how successfully NASA has made the case around Artemis over the last five years, and it it, it has retained the political support, and I think will, and eventually that may be tested, um, but it really is succeeding in its political design, unlike all other parts of NASA, particularly NASA science right now. Like from the NASA side, Artemis 3 is roughly equivalent to Artemis 2, maybe even a little easier because, yeah. I mean, you well, take, you're the, docking the same, with it, I guess. You take yeah. the same giant rocket, you fly it to the moon, you detach the Orion capsule, and then you dock. And then you dock again, and then you come home. And so from NASA's perspective, there's not a lot of additional things that need to be developed for them to be able to go to transition from Artemis 2 to Artemis 3. But from, as you said, from the SpaceX side, you've got to have this skyscraper take off, detach correctly, go to orbit, transfer fuel in space, probably high teens, 15 to 20 times <laughs> right. in space. It's got to fly to the moon. It's got to demonstrate that it can land on the moon. It's got to be able to return to orbit. It's got to demonstrate that it can hold on to its propellant for long periods of time at the, at the moon and be ready to dock with Orion. And, and, and as you said, I mean, it's like on the one hand, that is bonkers and exciting and amazing and it's complicated and we should not be surprised. And I and I, it feels to me like there are all these SpaceX fans that are just like so mad that everything is taking longer, that NASA is so slow and so on. Buckle up. Your favorite rocket is going to need some time to do this amazing job. Yeah, I mean, it's again, it's simultaneously incredible progress and it's going to take longer than they think. It, it it just always has, and everything SpaceX has done has taken longer, um, just historically. We, it, that's not a <laughs> the the level of discourse on this, as you know, is not the most uh, mature or uh, uh, nuanced. But it is. It's just gonna. You have to have patience because it's the. It's always too when humans get involved, the consequences of failure are so immense, invisible and symbolic. Not to mention, you don't want people to die. Uh, and space, as you know, is the most unforgiving <laughs> environment <laughs> to, to robots and humans. And so just the, you have to, you know, it, you don't, you, to SpaceX's credit, you, they figure it out by doing it. And that's, you, you really see that distinction compared to SLS, which they figure out by modeling endlessly and testing endlessly first because they just can't, they don't have the production line. 
And it's two very interesting dichotomies being presented that we're, we're what we're witnessing. And it's interesting that they kind of are both filling their political portions, uh, and, you know, generating their various constituencies needed to keep this forward. And it's been very successful. Uh, I've had this pet theory for a while that I keep meaning to write down, which is that NASA has been basically pursuing a policy of by outlier um, with SpaceX because SpaceX has just been so wildly successful, but SpaceX is uniquely successful. And we have not yet seen other commercial companies uh, achieve the type of success and outcome that SpaceX has. However, in, NASA- In America, I mean, you're starting, I mean, it hasn't happened yet, but China is going- Well, there's a lot of yets in all board. of this, Yeah, right? exactly, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's, I mean, and launch is, is obviously a distinct thing that has a huge commercial market. But we're talking about space. So, I mean, my point is that NASA's policy has been that every company will be a SpaceX. And so commercial lunar payload services, commercial uh, to the surface of the moon, commercial whatever, right? You're, they're, they're deploying it and fixed price contracts too for a lot of Artemis. They're deploying this in a lot of different places, which I think is a worthy, just to be clear, worthy experiment. Uh, we know how cost plus contract works or doesn't. Um, we've ran that experiment many, many times <laughs> to, to great frustration. Um, but I think it's just, it, it's a reminder. We don't necessarily expect just because something becomes commercial that it will succeed. Uh, we actually don't know. We're running a huge uh, test on it right now. SpaceX has, it, it still remains, I think, this a, like a three sigma outlier company compared to every other aerospace company out there. And we, it has done amazing things. We're depending on them, utterly dependent on them to succeed in this Uh as the American people or anyone, the whole coalition of Artemis uh, coalition is dependent on SpaceX um, and Blue Origin, obviously, to their degree. Um, but the we don't know. We just don't know. And so it's it is an incredible. It's a very exciting time. But yes, we should not be surprised or disappointed uh, if it takes longer, because it almost certainly will. This stuff is really hard, you know, which is. Everyone says that about space all the time. But again, it's just, it's just unforgiving. Um, but if, if anyone can do it, I guess they can because they have created that uh, culture and uh, built that talent pool for this type of thing, um, which they're very good at. And I think fundamentally it's a different paradigm. They, that we're sh like, like if all you wanted to do was put boots on the ground one more time, then mm -hmm. that, could, that could have been supplied. And but the but the goal is to come up with over the long term a more sustainable presence in the lunar environment. That mm -hmm. you're going to have the lunar gateway where astronauts go and spend time. You're going to have a reusable rocket that takes you to and from the lunar gateway down to the surface of the moon. And eventually, if Starship gets flight proven, then you can imagine a reusable rocket that takes you from the surface of the Earth to the lunar gateway. And now all of the pieces of this chain are reusable. And so mm -hmm. now we're going to and from the moon in a way that is a completely different way than we did it back in the Apollo era. And hopefully then it becomes permanent because, yep. you know, there's there's a whole group of this audience that remembers the Apollo era 50 plus years ago. And we're wondering, like, we should have been back to the moon, mm -hmm. but it was never we were never meant to go back to the moon in that in that one off way. So, yeah, I mean, certainly. And I think it's also telling it and important to remember, I think, in context that no, literally no other nation has even tried to do that either to send people to the moon. You could say now that China's probably trying uh, in, in a long, methodical approach, but really no. I mean, the Soviet Union had their brief flirtation with it, but not super serious. Um, yeah, no, I mean, but since Apollo era, uh, yeah, no one's even tried. And I think that speaks to the difficulty of the of the effort and the ex ongoing expense and complexity of it and yeah it, there's we have one i'm fond of saying we have one data point of a successful way to send humans to the moon and as you know anyone who has drawn a, a plot you can say you can draw any extrapolatory line you want from one data point you can have it go in this direction that direction whatever it doesn't tell you that much it's a it's a one-off strange thing so we're running this new experiment and you know, we've tried this in a sense a few times before uh, in the late 80s on the 20th anniversary of Apollo and then after the Columbia disaster. Both of those were notable failures um, based on, in a sense, the old way of doing business. And this is so far the most successful return to the moon program already since Apollo. Like the fact that we have, and again, 
it kind of took a, a bit of everything to do it. I think oh, notably there's the, the big context here is that just the shuttle ended and the ISS is ending. And that opens up the room and the budget to really do this. Um, and, and again, this is a whole other discussion that's kind of interesting. Like you, you could say the, the, the story you put out, I think, is very accurate and, and could very well lead to a sustained lunar presence. Um, but we've had the ISS for 30 years. And that's the old way of, you know, the old way of doing business. It's not a requirement necessarily. Like I think the ISS model, which is basically build a giant political coalition, international coalition, and then have no money to do anything else. So you got to hold on to the thing that you have and build in a sense, very firm and resilient bureaucratic structures around maintaining it um, as a way of maintaining sustainability too. Um, it's just, you can kind of do one of those at a time in the system we have in the U.S., and post ISS, if, the, if we get a lunar base or some sort of lunar presence, uh, you could theoretically have something sustained because it's the one thing you got. Um, that's maybe not the most romantic <laughs> way of, of putting this, but it's not. And my point is, is that it doesn't. I mean, it kind of ISS doesn't require commercial. It actually fostered the commercial industry. It was kind of leveraged to do it. It's actually probably one of the best legacies of the ISS, um, but it's. There, there's a number of ways to sustain things. And again, I just to make it clear. I'm very excited and curious to see if this experiment works because again, it's, it's a bigger pool. Um, what I would like not to see is have basically one monopoly company replaced by another monopoly company. And I think the big question is, are we going to have an actual marketplace of, of products and services or are we going to have one or maybe two that are paid for exclusively by the government? And I think the jury is really still out on that, at least yeah. for cislunar. As successful as SpaceX has been, having a genuine proper competitor, sh everybody should be celebrating that. Like you, you may like SpaceX, but you want Blue Origin to succeed because you don't want it to be a monopoly. You want multiple providers yeah. to be able to do this, this kind of work. All right, I mm -hmm. want to shift gears for the third time. Uh, and this is for us to talk about Mars sample return. And... It's kind of tied together with the first part story that we talked it's about. It's very much, yeah, it's absolutely tied to it, yeah. But, but I mean, already this mission was having trouble. So before February 7th, what was the story about what was going to happen with the Mars sample return mission? Where were we at? Yeah, so Mars sample return last year underwent an independent review, the second independent review. And that independent review committee... Uh, led by Orlando Figueroa, who had longtime Mars ma manager and worked at JPL and en Mars engineer, found some serious problems. Basically, said the the project as designed is unexecutable with any budget uh, on the schedule that they were trying to go for. So that's a bad sign when no amount of money you could throw at something would solve it. They found, I think, some rather serious management. Uh, errors and issues, right? That the fundamental structure and bureaucracy was was inefficient, uh, lacking clear authority, uh, was not leading towards success, um, and was having some serious problems trying to organize the vast array of inputs into the program, right? So it was JPL was making the lander. Uh, Marshall Space Flight Center is managing the Mars Ascent vehicle, the rocket. Uh, Goddard was building this containment con capture device to capture the samples in orbit. The European Space Agency was building, it committed a major $1.5 billion investment to build a Mars orbiter to capture those and bring them back to Earth. You're probably going to have to build a giant sample containment facility probably in Houston, right, at Johnson Space Center. Uh, you Mars sample return had been designed on purpose like Artemis, with the idea that you would have a political coalition, everyone would have a piece of it in order to buy into this major endeavor. Because you're talking about a three mission ish uh, campaign with the first auto, you know, robotic launch off the surface of another planet uh, in human history. And not to mention auto docking in orbit and then the incredible amount of planetary protection um, issues at hand of maintaining those samples. So yeah, the, the independent review said this is a project serious problem. Um, at the stage Mars sample return was in, there had been no formal cost projection. So this is a bit of a distinction because this has come out um, 
as an issue. NASA, the way that NASA works with these projects is that they basically spend tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars on a major project before you know how much it's going to cost because you have to design and figure out, can we, can we make this? How's it going to look? What's it going to do? Here's the contractors that are going to be involved. We lock in the design and then we can say how much it's going to take to actually build it and launch it and operate it. That process to figure this out is called formulation rather than implementation, but just formulation was still happening. So this was still a wide, nothing had been committed to and fixed. However, uh, in the decadal survey, which is the big scientific uh, community's you know, formal recommendations for priority, which has prioritized Mars sample return for this decade as the top mission to do, they put in a number uh, saying about $5.3 billion is what they were expecting this to cost. The independent review, however, said this project is likely to cost between nine to eleven billion dollars. Mm. Um, More than at, Web, uh, yeah, basically on the order yeah. of Web. Um, Web was, I think, with all the bells and whistles and operations, about ten point something billion. Um, yes, a lot of money. Um, and uh, you know, at this early stage, easily could see that going higher. Right? It's when the rubber hits the road and you're building the thing. Um, and why is that happening? I mean, in addition to the management problems, I mean, the problem is, is that you have this highly integrated, not, you know, a uh, system, you're, you're having a multiple connections between, you know, the launching vehicle, the Perseverance rover, the European made orbiter, they all have to connect and fit perfectly together and design and, and a change in one, right? If you change the, the diameter of the sample container, that holds your samples to launch into space. You're changing the volume on the spacecraft of the ESA rover uh, uh, orbiter, and you're changing the sample containment system made by Goddard. So, anytime a change is made anywhere else, it has these rippling impacts throughout it. You're also launching on this, as you most listeners know, a, a, a unforgivable celestial clock of your launch windows of when you can launch to Mars. Right, a couple of weeks every 26 months. And if you miss a launch window, you are stuck waiting for that next 26-month launch window. And so you, all of these things have to happen precisely together to get something on a pad ready to go to launch to Mars at a certain time and to come back to Earth at a certain time. So it's intensely complex. Add to this, too, that the samples that are being collected by the Perseverance rover are bespoke, right? They're, you don't have any more of them. Um, and so it has to work. And this is where I think... The discussion about how we approach this in the future, this is always the rub of it, right? You don't, for something this precious and this much work, and when you have so many single points of failure, that rocket has to launch, that those sample containers have to be integrated, have to be, you know, you have to be able to stick them into your launch vehicle. You have to be able to capture them in orbit. If you don't, the entire project fails and you get nothing. You get nothing from it, right? You only get science when everything comes back successfully. And so you're trying to design these systems to work, you know, 99.99999, however many nines you write. And every time you add like another nine of assurance in this type of business, you're, you know, rapidly escalating the cost of that level of mission assurance. You can want to do it cheaper, you will reduce your number of nine, right? <laughs> you reduce your certainty. But then if it explodes, you've spent six billion and you got nothing, right? So this is the rub. This is the problem of Mars sample return. Um, so again, so the problem, so this review comes out, all these issues raised, very legitimate issues. I don't think anyone disagrees with them. NASA basically hits pause on the entire project. And this is what has been the kind of the, the, I don't want to even say frustrating. Well, yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> that was in September. Um, and NASA said they would convene, what did it call an independent review committee response team or something like they they had NASA instituted a, a committee to review the Southern Committee's recommendations. Um, but what has been happening has not been public. It has been all closed door and has been going on a surprisingly long time. And so all that we know, in a sense, is that Mars sample return is in major trouble. And NASA is thinking about what to do, but has not said what it's going to do. And that lack of path forward from NASA has made it, I think, has basically made the project appear very vulnerable politically. Because 
advocates, and so it's so the Planetary Society, we support Mars sample return as a concept, right? We're not wedded to any particular implementation or even any particular NASA center doing it. It's like Mars sample return scientifically is incredibly important, really exciting, potentially transformative, and we should do it. But we don't know what we're advocating for because NASA hasn't come out and said yet what they want this to look like. And as a consequence, this blood's in the water. And this is where the Senate came in, in this context of budgets are shrinking. This project's now going to cost $11 billion. People start getting those PTSD from the web era of saying, this is going to eat my mission. This is going to stop our stuff. My thing is more important. Screw those Mars guys. And we're going to, we need to protect our own. Um, this is happening, I think, at the at the scientific level of, of inter-science, inter-science competition. This is happening intraplanetary science, right? Because people are seeing delays in their, like, Venus missions and missions to Titan that they are blaming on Mars sample return for, for that happening. And then also happening with intra-center, right? We're seeing a, a letter came out from uh, members of Congress from Maryland and Virginia saying that we want to protect Goddard and we want science at Goddard. And we're here to do what Goddard needs. And if it's not a Goddard, we don't care about it. <laughs> this is paraphrasing, but basically what they said. Um, and that's, you know, so Goddard want, really wants the Habitable Worlds Observatory, the big flagship observatory for uh, astrophysics. Uh, As do we all. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I, I, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they yes, really please. want that. But it's being pitched as, and in this, it, it it's very sad in a sense to see as soon as the budget goes down a little a lot of tension is coming coming out. Mm. Like this was easy to say we're going to do everything when the budgets were going up, yep. and now that things are shrinking, people are getting a little freaked out, um, and the politics around this are becoming a little you know sharp elbowed. And so as a consequence, then the Senate puts out this budget number for Mars sample return, which says you either keep this what the language said is you're going to NASA, you tell us how you're going to do this for that five billion dollar number, and if you can't, you are canceled. And then <laughs> what I think is an important reminder to the science community, they said, and should that happen if NASA can't do this, of the $300 million that we would give to Mars Sample Return next year, it's all going to go to Artemis. If you can't do this, it just leaves science altogether and goes to Artemis. So I think the scientific community who thinks, oh, if they just cancel Mars Sample Return, then my science mission can happen. We have an example from the Senate. It's like, no. It's just going to go to Artemis. It's just going to go into the human spaceflight bucket. Um, and so you you have this dichotomy set up. And so, but again, it's all happening. It's an again, it's this perfect storm of where NASA has lost political support, the budgets are shrinking, you're having unclear leadership on the project from NASA itself, that we don't know what NASA wants to do. And I think too the cost is chilling to a lot of people and it's a high risk mission where all of the science is backloaded at the end of it. And in, in the, ironically, at the end of the day, <laughs> the planetary science community that said they wanted this mission has very little to gain from a practical standpoint while it's happening, right? It's not funding scientists because it has no science mission uh, instruments on it. Uh, it's, it's, it's not going to give so james webb why did james webb succeed being 10 billion dollars because every astronomer can use web for something you can write a proposal you can get funded which is what you know the life of doing science it helps to be able to eat and pay your mortgage and you know buy clothes for your kids and all the other things you do you can get funded to study things on web for years right web launched you can use it to i'll point at a planet i'll point at a galaxy i'll point it at whatever as long as you're collecting photons web is pertinent to you Mars sample return will have these huge repercussions in terms of scientific understanding, but only in a sense through how we interpret things going forward. So you have a community of return sample scientists or meteoriticists. It just tends to be much smaller. They will do a lot of the studying of the samples when they get back, right? Nothing happens after launch for, for years, if not a decade after, after launch. And that just, so the scientific community is actually not a huge constituency of support for Mars sample return in a very practical sense um, because of the fundamental difference in how these missions work, right? And that's one of the big, I think, problems that we're seeing. And so Mars sample return had ha enjoyed, while the budgets were going up, huge amounts of political support, had been getting the money, um, was, you know, and then as soon as it hit this road bump, 
I think it collapsed relatively fast considering how supported it had been. And we're seeing this is a, a huge uncertainty now. And I think, again, if, if it doesn't go forward, it's a huge loss, um, not just for science. We'll have to do this eventually. So we're just pushing the problem down the line. Um, but also, implication is we went through this big formal process through the National Academies to say this is the top priority. If we just say, oh, we just don't do that anymore, then anyone who goes through this process in the future, whether it's Mars sample return or a mission to Uranus or Habitable Worlds, is like, oh, well, who cares if you say it's the top priority? We didn't care last time you said that. Why should we honor that? And it starts weakening the entire uh, system that we've developed to create through however, you know, these formalized processes to assert priority back into, in a sense, the bad old days where it's just people jockeying for who has the ear of so-and-so, who has the center support, who has the mm. political support to get their mission placed first. Right, so the um, whole point of the decadal yeah. survey then is to have this conversation, hash it out, agree as a scientific community, yeah. and then that sets priorities for the next 10 years, and, and you know immediately that you don't have to go into politics mode, you can just start going into working on your science mode yeah. and or preparing yourself for that next decadal survey 10 years from now. But, exactly. But if if the priorities defined by the scientists don't turn into actual missions, then there are no rules and we're back to Thunderdome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. yes, well put. Yeah, it's, and it, the, the phrase they used to bandy about, like the decadal survey is the sword and shield of the science, right? And so it's the sword to kind of push forward your agenda and also to defend the community in cuts. And if it turns out that it's, it's not that, yeah, then it, every other decadal is functionally weakened by not honoring the process of this one. And I think a lot of scientists may, and people just, you may not like the conclusion of that uh, kind of logical progress there, but I think that is, in a sense, the political lesson that will be learned and will be deployed by others going forward, um, whether it's in astronomy or heliophysics or earth science, which is notably the more partisan area, uh, unfortunately, right, of, of NASA, that this starts to become, oh, who cares if you have a decadal survey or not? It didn't matter with Mars. Um, why should it matter to you? And this is where I think the scientific community needs to think in a bigger picture about its long-term support and stability, even if uh, people aren't super excited personally about Mars sample return because of all, in a sense, the practical things that I outlined earlier, right? And, and I think, like, at, at the same time, we've got this, I don't know if it's a sort of Damocles, but the Chinese, as with the Artemis program, there is a timeline that the Chinese are planning to send humans to the moon by 2029. And for all of their pieces are coming together, new lander, new orbiter, uh, two new, you know, massive rocket, all of the pieces are in place that, and plus all of the precursor missions that have demonstrated all the fundamental technology. It feels like they are on track to meet their goal, 2029, 2030, we should see them land on the moon. And so if Starship is delayed, if Artemis takes more time, maybe we don't see the US land 2030, maybe it's 2031. Now they can always say, well, we did it 50 years ago, 60 years ago, so it doesn't really matter. You know, we already were the first on the moon. But you've got this same scenario happening with Mars Sample Return, which is that the Chinese are planning their own version of the Mars Sample Return mission, probably launching 2028, probably returning 2031. And that's on schedule. Tianwen was a demonstration of the technology to show that they can land on, on Mars safely, deploy a rover, deploy a lander. And now next, and, and then all the technology with the with the lunar missions is demonstrating that they can build ascent vehicles, bring samples back to Earth. They're doing, Tianwen-2 is going to be an asteroid sample return mission, which is one step. Again, you're seeing this step-by-step -step incremental approach to solving this problem. Theirs is nowhere near as complicated as, as Mars sample return mission is going to be, but I feel pretty confident that they're going to pull it off. They're going to move through the steps and launch their rocket in 2028 and have samples back on Earth by 2031. And that is something that, that nobody has ever done before. Do you, do you feel, it feels to me that, that this is going to be delayed. It's going to sort of sit in a quagmire for a couple of years and then people are going to panic. 
when it's when they realize that yeah. they're not going to get their samples back in time to beat the Chinese. Yeah, I, it's that whole. It, it's going to be really interesting to see how this moves forward because yes, and and I believe that the Chinese uh, space. Uh, program's approach to sample return is essentially a grab and go. Yeah, so yeah, much super simpler. Simple. They yeah. they land, they grab whatever's there, and then they come back. And <laughs> yeah. it's it's maybe not a helicopter. As, yeah, it's not as rich of a scientific. So I mean, the it, it's distinct in the sense that so you, you know the, the scientific community in the U.S. and Europe that is behind this effort can say like, look, our samples are better, <laughs> right? Yeah. They've, they've been very carefully and painstakingly collected. They did all this context analysis. I mean, this was an important part of it defined by the scientific community. It's like, if you want this to be the biggest bang for your buck, you know, you're going to a Delta, you're looking for where organics concentrate. You're picking up those samples and preparing yeah. them and sealing yeah, you're them. You're drilling and, beneath the surface. You're grabbing and, samples of air in situ. You're, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, exactly. It's very careful. However, none of that means anything if you don't bring them back. <laughs> Back, right. right and burn, something burn in the hand versus bush right? yeah and i think the the chinese approach is simpler it's like we'll get something back and we'll learn something kind of it's similar in a way to apollo samples right like at least at the beginning you just grab whatever you land on in the safest spot in the moon and you're just happy to have moon rocks um turns out they were statistically skewed to one particular sample right it's just like you you wish you could go back and do it again but again you still have something um the interest, so we saw Bill Nelson, NASA administrator, has not been shy to draw China as a competitive threat and using space as a means to, to offset that. Um, the problem is in terms of, I think, an actual practicality, and I'm just, I'm stepping back from like whether or not one accepts that as a valid thing, because I think it's debatable, but it's clearly at least gets some traction in the U.S., political system. But the problem in a sense, in terms of just a practical implementation of that is that you, he does that for Artemis too. And people do it for Artemis too, as, as you point out. And I think there's only really room for that to work in one program. So, and in a sense, and this is another interesting strategic problem from our sample return is that Artemis ticks off basically all the boxes that you use to argue from our sample return, right? It's a big international contribution, right? It has a huge coalition of like-minded U.S. allies and, and partners. It serves as a very powerful symbol. It is very hard to do. You are trying to beat out or show up, you know, the power of your allied system over a competing uh, philosophical uh, political system. Um, it, with China and, and its alignment with with Russia and a few other countries in terms of what they're doing at the moon. And you say that with Mars sampler term, people go, great. Well, but didn't we just figure that out with Artemis? <laughs> That's why we're funding Artemis, right? So we get all that stuff there too. And it's more, frank, frankly, it is probably more powerfully symbolic to see humans on the moon again rather than rocks come back from Mars just in terms of, of just regular folks. But, but there may be I, things out of their control. I guess I just feel like with Artemis, we talked about this before, there's stuff yeah. that's out of NASA's <laughs> control, right? Yeah, there's, there is the big, big question mark, question mark, question mark, SpaceX rocket yeah, that is entirely a black box at this point. Yeah, I, I, yes, I think that's all true. However, the leadership of NASA, particularly right now, is not going to prioritize a robotic program over a human spaceflight. And NASA just generally, no leadership generally does, but Bill Nelson in particular yeah, he's, he's a human spaceflight guy. He flew in space, right? He's, <laughs> he's 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 not technically an astronaut like other astronauts have been, but he flew in space and he represented Florida. He's a human spaceflight guy, and Artemis is his thing. And he is, if there's one thing he's going to support, it's going to be that. And when your back is against the wall and the budgets are going down, you don't get the luxury of supporting everything. And this is the problem. And I think we've seen. You know, in the two draft budgets we've seen from the Congress uh, that I mentioned earlier, within those, Artemis does grow. So even in a flat or shrinking NASA budget, within that diminishing NASA budget, in both House and Senate, Artemis gets bigger. And that difference, what makes up that difference is coming from NASA science. And this is why the pressures on Mars sample return to say, oh, if we just excise Mars sample return 
And so I said, it goes into Artemis and that helps then Artemis move forward. That's where the, I think if you were to corner Bill Nelson and to say, what is the one priority NASA is doing right now? He will say Artemis over anything else. And you have seen this reflected politically. And that's again, one of the huge problems the Mars sample return is facing right now is that you just don't have the luxury of being number two. It doesn't get you very far. And it, it always makes me really unsettled to, to think that people who are fans of human spaceflight or you know, people working on human spaceflight and people who are working on science even have to compete in the first place. That, that there should be some division. And maybe as there is more commercial activity, more, you know, that you can go down, the, the folks at JBL can just go down to the SpaceX rocket shop and, and pick the launcher for their mission, that they will have separate budgets and there won't be this. Because I, like, I feel like it's an arbitrary distinction that has been imposed on people that they, that they have to have these battlegrounds and they're, it's totally unnecessary. You know? Yes. I mean, it's, but it's also, it's hard when you do have, the problem is we're back to a zero sum budgeting game. So what, again, what, what would made this all kumbaya and supportive in the last 10 years is that the budgets were just going bigger. And so everyone could win and we don't have a situation now where everyone can win. And we are seeing a reassertion of, in a sense, hierarchy, political hierarchy. Um, I agree with you, though. It is much, it, 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 yes, it's sad and it shouldn't be. And, and I don't even necessarily think within NASA it's pitched that way. I'm just saying it's like if the leadership has to support one thing, they're going to support the big thing, right, which is the, the human spaceflight project. Um, but you have, it's a little more nuanced, I think, I think, with Mars sample return because it actually fits really, really well into human spaceflight plans of going to Mars, right? If you want to go to Mars, it helps to know how to launch off the surface of Mars, right? That's like, let's test that out. Um, and we have now a congressionally mandated moon to Mars direct, uh, division within the human spaceflight directorate uh, that I think should probably be kicking in. That, to me, a, a, a good path forward would be for the human directorate to jointly fund Mars sample return to take some of the pressure off of science um, in order to validate and demonstrate key, key technologies of how to get humans back from Mars safely. Uh, what's the dust environment like? How does that impact a rocket? What's the performance of a rocket like taking off from the surface? That's been sitting in sub-zero temperatures for two years. You know, how do we manage and launch things safely? What kind of redundancies do we need? What problems and difficulties are there in orbit to, to dock around a planet and around a separate planet um, with a 30, you know, 15 to 30 minute light communication distance from, from Earth? All these things would be really wonderful to know, and we have an opportunity to test them that then also serves a profound scientific interest. And, um, and, and so and it's, that's yeah. how the and, and I think back to our conversation, that's how the Chinese are seeing this, mm. right? They're seeing the Mars sample return the, or the moon sample return mission as part of this larger demonstration of technology to bring humans back from the moon. That that their first part of the, the Tim One Three is going to be this Mars sample return mission, but as you said, this is testing the technology to then later on bring humans. You know, they are also expecting to start sending humans to Mars in the mid twenty thirties, maybe early twenty forties. So you're exactly right that that I, I never even thought of it, but I think you're you're exactly one hundred percent right that that Mars sample return is actually a precursor technology to sending humans to Mars. And if you can't nail that down and at least know within an order of magnitude how complicated and what this is going to cost, you're never going to bring humans back from Mars. Yeah. And again, it just it makes a ton of, you'd have to do something like this anyway. Yep. Right. Um, and so we might as well do this now and do it with the scientific support and impetus and potential. Again, the benefit is, is just enormous. Um, Casey, what yeah. is the Planetary Society doing now? What's the plan? So, I mean, we, we have our principles, kind of what I mentioned earlier, that we support you know, Mars. I mean, it's frankly a bit tough because, again, we need to know what NASA wants to do. We can't dictate that to them. We're not engineers. You know, they need to know how to solve this. They have to solve their management problems, and we need they need to provide a, a viable path to doing this in a sustainable way. So we talk about sustainability. The easiest way, I think, and this is what we mentioned in our principles, 
um, that we're sharing around. So first we're, we're communicating, we're building support for, and it's not just Mars sample return, NASA Yeah, I was, I was more hoping like just in general, like, yeah. like with the, it's, what happened today, what's going on with Artemis, what's going on with yeah. Mars sample, how, you know, the Planetary Society's role is to yeah. promote and encourage space flight of all forms and science. So what, so what are you guys working on? Yeah. So we're, we're working on getting the support for NASA science. So the first thing we have to do, I think, is show that NASA science is not the piggy bank for Artemis, right? And it's, we, when we cut things, there are consequences that we're seeing these, right? These aren't abstract ideas. And we have truly important and epical kind of scientific discoveries waiting for us in astrophysics and planetary science and elsewhere that we can just do. And this is where, so we've been out on the ground really hard pushing this, that we need a broad commitment to science, that we cannot step away right now. We've got this momentum, we've got the policies, we've got the buy-in from the scientific community, and we need to get through this constriction, this tight moment. And we need to do that smartly. And I think, so we're pushing, you know, we want NASA to come forward. What we've suggested is that if we can ramp down spending, annual spending in Mars sample return to an acceptable, like a, a, a level that you can maintain balance within planetary science, astrophysics, it will push out the, the mission. I think we need, I, in a sense, you have to kind of seed whatever competition or assume that the Chinese Mars rovers probably, uh, sample return probably will take longer themselves too. That's a hard thing to do. But the motivation for sample return can't just be a race. You know, the fundamentals are so strong. We just need to do it right. And we need to do it now, but we can do it with balance. And I think that's where we can ramp down that annual spending. Just accept that it's going to be later. That's okay. Right. The samples will survive as long as we are pushing forward to get them. Um, and then build this tight interaction between human spaceflight, long-term planning, and Mars sample return. Um, we have our day of action coming up in April, the end of uh, uh, April 28th and 29th, uh, where we're you can register with us. We will we're going to do in-person visits with members of Congress to promote these scientific priorities, including Mars sample return. Anyone uh, with a U.S. address is welcome to join us for that. Uh, I'm in out. Person. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. There's only so much in the U.S. political system uh, you can do outside of that. But if you do live in the U.S., um, you can meet us in Washington, D.C. We'll schedule your meetings. We'll give you training. Uh, you'll go with groups of people. It's super fun. It's also really valuable. We're one of the most valuable things you can do. Uh, we do have things online as of today that you can write in support of um, NASA and NASA Science to help reverse these cuts uh, that we're seeing to JPL. And again, it's a... It's, it's advocacy is something that just it, you have to build momentum over time. And we're seeing, in a sense, uh, a lot of, I think, directionless panic is maybe too strong of a word, but a lot of people are just not we haven't been in the situation as you said, in 10 years and we need to learn how to come together. And what we're really trying to push and it's like, how do we come together as a broad space science community to say to stop infighting? and work together to kind of push our agenda forward. And, you know, at the end of the day, money is a huge part of that, but it can't just be money. We have to have and expect higher standards of performance and management from NASA and its centers and partners to execute these missions. Not everything, you know, we've all gone through inflation. That is the reality. The things are just going to cost more, but that only goes up to a point. And I think if we lose this momentum, 30 years of investment in Mars, that's going to be a very sad ending to this whole story to just leave those samples slowly collecting dust for eons on the surface of another planet. Casey, thank you so much for your time. Of course, you know, you can find your work at the Planetary Society. You blog regularly. You are a regular guest on the on the and my podcast. podcast. Well, I, I, I'm not just a guest. I host our, uh, a monthly version uh, called the yes. Space Policy Edition. Yeah. Uh, which you can just catch on our normal planetary radio feed, or you can subscribe directly to it. Just search for Space Policy Edition. Yeah. And it is one of my favorites because it is a part of this whole field that I barely understand and barely think about. I think about the outcomes and the science, and you're very much on the let's make this stuff happen. I get to report on the results, but you're very much you know on on how it all comes together and. Uh, and I think if you if you're interested in like just how space policy works, I think you'll find the podcast absolutely fascinating. So again, thank you, Casey. Always a pleasure to catch up with you, and good luck. Uh, I guess <laughs> bringing samples home from Mars. 
Yeah, all of us, uh, all of yeah. us can help with that. So thank you, Fraser. Always, uh, always a pleasure to be here. All right, we'll see you next time. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Casey Dreyer and definitely go and sign up to Casey's podcast or just Planetary Radio in general. It's an amazing podcast. Now, I'm going to talk some more about my thoughts about this, but here is me from a previous video thanking our patrons. Thanks to Paul Rohrbach, Abe Kingston, Hey Twilight, Dougie Stewart, Stephen Krasaki, David Richards, Mark Ansis, Joel Yancey, Antonio Lofilara, Dustin Cable, Vlad Shiplett, Modso, George, David Giltonen, Andrew Gross, Jeremy Matter, Josh Schultz, and Jordan Young, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. Well, this is kind of a tricky time in space exploration. I think as, as Casey said, we've gone through like a decade of the good times where Budgets kept going up and everybody kind of got what they wanted and things were good. And suddenly through, because of political reasons, just because of budgeting issues, things are tightening up a little. And we're starting to see that this is these lean times where hard decisions have to get made. People may lose their jobs. It's going to be tough. And I think the next couple of years, you're going to see more of this sort of belt tightening and various missions. We're going to see what things are going to be stripped back. Hopefully it won't be as bad and hopefully the budgets will return and things will grow and science policies will be fulfilled. But just like prepare yourself emotionally for uh, what it's going to probably be a tricky couple of years. All right. Uh, We've got lots of interviews and information about space exploration in general, including some of the interesting missions that might be on the cutting block. Uh, so I'm going to link to a couple randomly here. All right. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. <laughs>